What's up everybody? Um, so honestly, I'm super pumped for this week and, and literally like I've prayed, God help us understand this lesson. And um, I just want to dive straight in and, and, and just talk about really what we think about in churches. And, and mostly I'll be speaking to you know Christians, and, and, uh, but I, I definitely also want to speak to the people who are not Christians in the room. But I'm going to pick on Christians first. So um, last week we're coming off the heels of this amazing story of what God has done. This story of the Exodus where God literally saves the entire nation of Israel. And like for us, like it's you know obvious in Scripture, this is a huge deal that they're going to like echo back or they're going to look back at this event over and over and over again in the Old Testament time and time again to say this is what God has done and this is who God is and what he's like and for us like it's this huge event and so as I'm thinking about what we think um, in our churches and in our culture now uh, it's this question after the big event so for us um, a lot of our, our events for especially young people, um, but like our events are these huge kind of rah-rah, like high energy events. And, and even to some extent, that's what's happening in our churches today. Like there are these worship services, these worship events, and they're high energy. But then it's like, what do you do now? What do you do after the big event? And so for us, I just want to point blank say like I think we're addicted like I think we're I think we're addicted to these high energy big moments in our spiritual lives but then like what do we do after those big moments what do we do after the big moment and so for us I think it leaves a lot of us if we're being really honest with ourselves um, feeling pretty empty, pretty hollow. And I, I would say for you, Christians probably, and, and, and non-Christians for sure, um, they're sitting there asking like, does this Christianity, does this faith have any real substance outside of those big moments, after those big moments? And that's why we love the Old Testament. That's why I personally love the Old Testament because it gives this kind of gritty, real life, you know, it's got this realness to it, this picture of life with God, life in the day to day. And so for us, man, like I want you guys to get this, to understand this lesson so badly. And the best way I know how to communicate it to you is um, through the way that God has taught me. So for me, um, the best thing and the best way that I have learned about living in relationship to God and with God is through marriage. And so, you know, I, when I think back on my wedding day, it was this huge moment, you know, seeing Rachel walk down the aisle um, for the very first time is like this image seared in my brain. And like we had this huge celebration afterwards at the reception. And it's like, that was an amazing thing. And I'm not bragging to say we had a better wedding than anyone else. Like it was pretty lit. But um, for me, like that is such a small portion of my marriage with Rachel and so I wish you guys you know I wish I could like just impart this like feeling that I have that man like being with Rachel and, and getting to live with her and, and love her and experience hardship with her the past five years man that is like so so good like it, if you only knew it, and you guys can experience relationships outside of marriage of course that teach you about God but it's in these real relationships these real life moments that we come to understand what this you know connection this love this relationship is really about and so for us I want to use this you know simple analogy of marriage to communicate like how we are to relate with God after the big moments, after you know the big worship services, the big events, like what now? Well, man, like I hope that you can see that that's when it gets really good. Like the marriage is good. Like this, you know, for the Israelites, the Exodus is good. 
but man, they're going to experience the goodness of God, the beauty of God through this daily relationship, this everyday, you know, ordinary life relating to God, like day after day. And so for us, man, I don't want you to miss the beauty of what's being communicated in this story, this life after the big moment, this life after the Exodus. So after this amazing, huge moment of salvation, when they are saved from the Egyptians, um, stuff starts getting really, real, really fast. So they, they go through, the Red Sea is parted, they walk through, and then they sing, and they celebrate, and they dance what God has done. And then the, the Israelites um, start to you know, make their way through this desert um, to this mountain called Sinai. But along the way, which is in Exodus chapters, you know, 16, 17, and 18, like, I just want to recap these chapters because there's some gold here and, and, some, and make some quick points about it before we really get into our text that we're going to talk about, uh, which is chapters 19, 20, and 24. So they're making their way towards Sinai, and um, almost immediately the Israelites start to grumble and complain because they don't have food. And so they're really like casting all these complaints towards Aaron and Moses. And they just start to sort of pine away about like how bad things are out in the desert and how you know they have no food and they had food when they even they were in slavery in Egypt and they're like you know pining away for for the the times the good old days back in Egypt but they were in slavery and so it says that God hears their grumbling and he even provides for them manna and quail and manna is this bread that quite literally comes from heaven and it tastes like honey and you get this like interesting point in there and this connects to you like this isn't just a story um man like if we're like equating salvation like some of you have been uh, you know they ha they were saved and then now they're wandering and they're they're figuring out how to live life with god now to to be with god in the desert Man, some of you sitting there right now have already experienced salvation. You've given your life to God. You, you, you've been baptized. But now, like, there's this thought in the back of your mind. It's like, man, like, it was a little bit better back in slavery. It was a little bit better and, and more fun, maybe, my life before Christ. And so you maybe start to pine away about like, man, why don't all my friends get to have fun in college and do the things that they want to do? And I have all these oppressive rules, you know, like they're out partying, having fun. And like, you know, for me, it's like, man, wouldn't it be better to just go back to the way things were before I had to follow all these rules? And, and it's like we're pining away for our days back in slavery. And don't miss this. Like God hears them, provides them something that this bread called manna that tastes like honey. And, and don't miss the point where it's like, God has promised to take them to a land flowing with milk and honey. And so hopefully you're making that connection where it's like, God is saying like, this is just a little taste of what life is like with me. It's a foreshadowing of what's to come. And God is saying, life with me is good. You are experiencing freedom and I am leading to you, you to a place that you have no idea how good it is. But I want you to experience it right here and right now. So for us, man, like I don't want you to miss that point that, that this applies to you and your walk with God. Like you may pine away for a day when things were easier, but God is leading you to a better place. And so as like they continue through the desert, they, they're still complaining. They're, even they have like a lack of water and they say, you know, Moses, what if you like let us out here to see our children, you know, die of thirst in the desert? And so God hears them again and he tells Moses to strike a rock and it produces water. And, and one of the most interesting points in that story there is they say like, is God even among us? Like, is God with us? Did he lead us out here to the desert to die? 
So after he provides them water, these people called the Amalekites come and attack them. And God, it's an amazing story. Read it like God does some amazing things and they win this victory. They win uh, the battle against the Amalekites in, in a really cool way. And what Moses says at the end of it, he says, the Lord is my banner, which is this kind of strange phrase. And, and like I even was thinking about what does that mean? Like the Lord is my banner after they've won this victory. And so I think, you know, hey, like all this connects maybe. And so the question before was, is God even among us? And if you think about a banner in relation to you, if you go over to the CC, there's banners hanging up for all different types of organizations, flags, flying. A banner is like hung by someone for someone else to see it. So it's like important for the person that hangs it. It's important for the person who sees it. And it's this unmistakable, undeniable sign that you can look to. And so I think what Moses is saying here is like, yes, like God is among us. Look at what he's doing among us. Like it is unmistakable, undeniable what God is doing. We just like got water from a rock. There's manna from heaven. Like we are, had victory over our enemies. And so for us, I think that point is like, it, is the Lord our banner? Is it unmistakable what God is doing among us and what God is doing in us? And so the story continues down in chapter 18. And you get this, um, you know, Moses' father-in-law, whose name is Jethro, but also Rule, uh, man so nice they named him twice. So he comes, and because all this connects, it's like, what? This is awesome. Like, because all this connects, you, know, you have this question, is God among us? And then his father-in-law, who is not an Israelite, who is not a Jew, comes because he says, I have heard what God is doing among you. I've heard what God did among you. And so you have really this first convert. And, and he even like helps Moses. So Moses is, is leading and he's you know, really taking on most of the burden of leadership himself. So Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, tells Moses that the burden of leadership is too heavy for one person. And so he tells them to, to teach and instruct some other men so that they can, um, you know, share some of the load and the responsibility of leading these people. And man, like what a great application point for us this year. Like there's no way we can all meet together and, and, and have a midweek like in person with a huge packed room. But man, like I want you guys to know that like if you take your faith seriously, if you really love God and you really love the people around you, like God is going to do so much more through you and your small groups and all the people that y'all are personally connected to than just getting together and worshiping in a room and, and just having this spiritual high. And so like, man, I hope that God is speaking to you and you're beginning to think about, man, what if next year I led my own small group? with you know my sports team my friend circle you know in my dorm and so i don't want you guys to miss that that you know we share this responsibility of leading and sharing the goodness of god with the people around us and it's done so much better in community and don't miss the point here where um, you know this guy who's not an israelite comes up with this idea so for you deep thinkers out here just want to ponder on like you know, we can't relegate or we can't reduce every good idea down to a you know, Christian thought. There are other good leaders out there. There are other good ideas out there. But I would make the argument, it's like, what are, those, what are the ends of those good ideas? What are they leading towards? Are they pointing to our glory or to the glory of God? So um, at this point, the Israelites have made their way through the desert and they're actually at the foot of this mountain called Sinai. And I want to read for us from Genesis 19, verses 1 through 6, um, just what's going on here, and we'll talk about it. In the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on the very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from the Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. 
You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Amazing stuff here in these six verses, you know, first six verses of chapter 19. So they come to this mountain and God says, I'm going to make you into a kingdom. I'm going to make you into a nation of priests. And he says, like, if you follow these teachings, if you are shaped by these laws, if you are shaped by the justice that's communicated in them, like, if, if you follow this, if you take this to heart, man, you will be a kingdom. You will be a nation of priests. And I hope that you're starting to think back to our very first chapters of Genesis. Whenever God says, man, you are going to be my representatives to the rest of the world. Like, you are going to fill the earth and multiply, but in doing that, you are going to be my image bearers, bearing my goodness to the rest of creation, to the rest of the people that exist, to the rest of the world. All of these things like connect. And I hope, I really hope that you're seeing like how all of this thread, there's a continuity in these stories and what God is doing. And so you have these, you know, Really, human beings were really priests in this garden of Eden, in this temple where God's rule and reign is perfect with people, the land, and and, and we have great relationships with one another. And God says, I'm going to make this nation of Israel into a nation of priests that represent me to the rest of the world. And so shortly after he says that this is like how I'm going to do it, we get him you know, speaking to Moses in this chapter and he says, I'm going to come down. Like I'm going to come down uh, and I will be in front of the people. I'm going to descend upon the mountain. But you need to consecrate yourselves. You need to prepare for me to come down. And it's like, what are we supposed to, to make of this word consecrate? Like it carries the idea of like dedicating ourselves to God, to, you know, to make something holy, to prepare. And it's like, you know, essentially we are preparing to meet God. And that requires some things of us. Because God says in this story to Moses, like, I'm going to come down on the third day, consecrate yourself for two days, and then I'll be there on day three. And you get this like extreme language that's used in chapter 19 that that God says, you know, Moses warn the people, tell them that, that none of them need to touch even the foot of the mountain because if they do, they will be put to death. And in this extremely, um, honestly for me, it's like extremely terrifying scene. You see what God is like, um, you know, literally, like, you see what happens as he descends upon the mountain. And and for you, I don't know how you read these stories, but I want you to imagine the sounds and the sights of this. So you have this cloud, like, descending upon the mountain, and there's thunder, and there's lightning striking, and, like, you know, all of these things are happening as this thick cloud descends upon the mountain, and it says that it was covered with smoke, and it even describes it like there's this like thick smoke billowing up from the mountain like it's a furnace and, and, and there's fire. And at the same time, like there's this trumpet blast going off. So you already have thunder, but you have this trumpet blast and it's getting louder and louder and louder. And in addition to all that, like the, the mountain itself is violently trembling. And so... How should you respond to that? I don't know, but the people here like set a pretty good precedent and like they were trembling with fear. So as God descends upon this mountain, he says, it's holy. And the people see these things. They hear these things as God is descending this smoke billowing fire mountain with thunder and a trumpet blast. And they're scared out of their minds. They are terrified. And God speaks 
to Moses and the people just hear thunder. And so as we construct our image of God, like this has to be a part of it. This has to play a role in how we think about God. And hopefully in this image of, of smoke and fire, this is not the first time we've seen it. Hopefully you're thinking back to Genesis 15 that, that Dylan taught about. Like when God makes a covenant with Abraham, he's represented as this smoking fire pot walking through the pieces of the animals. And also the, the story that we just talked about in Exodus, God leads the Israelites out of Egypt and the way that he's represented is this pillar of fire, this pillar of smoke. And so what are we to do with that? Like that is an intense imagery to describe what, what Moses is seeing, what the people of God are seeing when he comes down and descends upon this mountain. And so as Moses goes up the mountain to quite literally meet with God, he warns these people. He says, you know, don't let them break through. Don't let them try to approach me now because if they do, they will die. If they come into my presence now, they will die. They need to consecrate themselves or I will break out amongst them. And so these people can't even set foot on the mountain that God is descending upon because God is holy. God is holy. And so for me, like, I, I really hope that you're starting to apply this to your own situation. It's not just some story that, you know, oh, that's pretty crazy. Like, I hope that you're thinking about it. So as I thought about my life, you know, as I come into church, you know, and, and I believe you know, we can connect with God at any moment throughout the day. But as I come into church on Sunday, Sunday mornings, like, you know, a lot of the time it's like I got like, still got some glaze from the donuts I ate like 20 minutes ago on my lips. You know, I'm just kind of like spilled out of bed, you know, at, at 9.30 to get there at like 10.15. And it's like, man, what, like how much irreverence is in that? Like I'm coming to interact with this God that's described as this billowing furnace on a mountain and like if I even set foot on the same mountain that he's on that I might die if I come into his presence in a way that it, that is not fit to be in God's presence and so it's like how much reverence do I show for the holiness of God so I don't want you guys to get confused on what I'm saying like I don't think that I, I personally make myself holy, but this, there is a point to be made here about the way that we treat God. You know, God says, if you are preparing to meet me, like you need to consecrate yourself for two days to these people. So for me, like, you know, I don't think there's a direct application of, you know, every, you know, I got to consecrate myself for two days before I meet God. But it's this thing where it's like, how do how do I come into the presence of God? You know, how do I treat like spending time with God because there should be a reverence, there should be a holy fear that that God is this holy God and coming into his presence is a special special thing and it should be treated that way. And so, you know, to make this clear, like God does not act like Genesis 3 never happened that this fall, you know, that Adam and Eve sinned. He, he's not interacting with humans like that never happened. The biggest part of, of that story of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3 is that, that we lost our access to the presence of God because if we are sinful and God is holy, that creates a problem. Now, what are, we, what are we to do with that? How are we to be around this God? How are we to be in the presence of this holy God? How can I stand before God Almighty? So the, the obvious conclusion is either I have to change, either we have to change, or God has to change. 
So I'm super excited to talk about this next section um, because it's probably what most of you think about whenever you think about the Old Testament. And so this is the section in which God gives the Israelites the Ten Commandments. This He, he has this covenant and these terms of the covenant with the Israelites. And so for you, like, it, it may just be these archaic, these old rules, these outdated, you know, laws. And, you know, for some of you, it might just be billboards that you see as you drive through the roads in the South or something that your grandpa talks about, you know, why this country is going down the tubes because we can't get back to these. Like, I want you guys to understand the heart and, and, and behind these rules because I feel like there's so many people out there that just fundamentally misunderstand what is going on here. And so I hope that you have some amazing talk in your small group afterwards. Um, but as we jump into chapter 20 of Exodus, I want you to read and, and I want you to highlight verse 2 of chapter 20. It says this, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of of slavery. So why in the world would God um, say that to the Israelites before he gives them all of these commandments, all of these regulations, rules, however you want to um, classify it? Man, please, like I am begging you, please understand this. Please talk about this. God starts by saying, you were saved. And so he starts before he gives them the rules, the regulation, the terms and conditions, he says, I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of slavery. I saved you. So now start acting like a saved person. Now, like that you have been saved, start acting like it. And this is how you are to act like it. It's not the other way around. So please don't hear like, you do these things and you earn your way. If I follow these rules like really, really well, that will make me holy and then God will accept me. God has already saved these people and now he lays out this, these terms and conditions and he says like start acting like saved people. And so a very, very helpful way to understand this for me personally is that salvation has already happened for these people. But God is saying, if you are going to really be my people, if you are going to be priests, and that might freak you out, you know, call yourself a priest, like just think about God's representative to the world. If you are going to be that, like you will be a citizen in my kingdom. So like... All throughout the New Testament, Jesus talks about the kingdom of God. There's this talk about God's kingdom. And whenever we think about this, automatically, I think, you know, for me and probably most Americans, we, we think of the land itself, like the actual land, this kingdom, this, you know, maybe this state. But for, for you guys, like as you think about God's kingdom and being a citizen of God's kingdom, I want you to think that God's kingdom is where God is in full where God is fully in control. You can think of this like God's kingship, God's rule. And this is saying when where I'm ruling, where I'm reigning, where I am in control, what my kingdom looks like, what my people look like is this. Like this is what I intended for human beings. And so we get this thing where it's like we don't live like to work our way into God's good graces, to God's approval. We live in response as subjects, as citizens of God's kingdom. And I want you so desperately to understand that this is a response. You know, the big event has happened. Your salvation has happened. The Israelites' salvation has happened. But now they need to start living like it. And so God is king, and this is what people in his kingdom look like. This is what he intends. So I'm not going to dive into all the details of this, but in the Ten Commandments, he says, there are no other gods. There are no other gods before me. You should be fully devoted to me, and there are no idols, because I am a jealous God. And you know, highlight that. What, what does he mean, jealous? You know, we have this image of God as like this 
impersonal, you know, being that stands far off. But he says, I'm jealous. I want you and I want all of you. And so, you know, what are the things that are competing for that in our lives? What are the things that, you know, look at your time that you spend. Look at the money that you spend. I want you to like literally write these down. What are the things that I spend my time and money on? Because maybe those are some idols that are competing for your devotion, for your adoration, and dare I say it, your worship. And so then he says, I don't want anyone to have an irreverent use of my name. You know, my name, like think about the image of, like, of this God as like on the mountain, the sounds and the holiness and just the power that, that is presented in these chapters. And then think about like, you know, flippantly just using God in conversation and a joke. He's saying like, I am holy and, and I want you guys to revere my name. I want you guys to respect my name because it is central to who you are and central to who he is, is he is a holy God. And then he says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. What in the world does that mean? Like you, the Sabbath was this rest day. And think about the people that he's talking to. These were people whose only role in life up until this point was to wake up seven days a week as slaves and make bricks. Go to bed, wake up, make bricks, go to bed, wake up, make bricks, go to bed. That was their life. And then this God says, you need to take a rest day. One day, do absolutely nothing. Worship me. That's your only point on that day. Why would God throw that in there? Honor your father and mother. Don't murder one another. Don't cheat on your spouse. Don't steal from one another. Don't lie to your neighbor. Don't lie about your neighbor. Don't be consumed with any desire or envy for what your neighbor has. What is going on here? You know, that was my version of the Ten Commandments. You read them for yourself, please. Like, do your own interpretation. But we have this, this account of these Ten Commandments. And then, you know, Moses says to the people, like, don't be afraid, like, because I get scared again about the billowing smoke and the thunder. And they just ask, they say, like, Moses, can you just speak to us? Like, we don't even want to talk to God face to face. Like, we're so scared. We'll just deal with you. And Moses says, don't be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning so that you can come into God's presence. And so you have these Ten Commandments and then chapter 20 verses 22 all the way through 23, 19, you know, you have this expansion upon these. And, and again, I'm not going to go into the detail because I'm trying to hit at the heart of what's being communicated here is all of this stuff is an expansion on the Ten Commandments, you know, uh, 2022 20, through 23:19, but this is stuff that reveals the character of God. This is what God says my kingdom should look like. This is what He wants for His people. So you have these this expansion after the Ten Commandments. There's 52 commands in there, and really it it talks about how they should worship. It talks about these social dynamics that include social justice. It's almost like this stuff is still relevant today that includes like how we should live with one another and there's social responsibility involved and, and, and there's talk of like remembering what God has done for them. And so again, God doesn't interact with us like Genesis 3, the fall and sin doesn't happen. But these are these gracious standards that God gives us that we have to meet if we are to be subjects of His kingdom. And the way that I want you to understand that is, is He is reteaching us because we lost you know, our, our ability, our access to His presence. He is reteaching us how to live with one another and how to live with Him. How to live in His presence. And this is what God's kingdom looks like. And so he sets these standards 
And I think for a lot of us, like, we honestly think that, that Jesus kind of is this dude, you know, like, you know, common, you know, maybe a hippie just walking around the Middle East that, like, lowers the bar. And he's just talking about, like, grace and love. And those things are true. He does talk about grace and love. But I want you guys to read Matthew 5 through 7. So what that is, is it's, it's Jesus taking this this covenant, you know, the Ten Commandments and following, and He does not lower the bar, but Jesus raises the bar. He raises the standard, and He hits at the heart of what these laws were for. So please track with me, follow me with this, because it is so good. Jesus says, you know, people question about it, like, did, you know, did you come to abolish the law? And Jesus says, in no way. Like, I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill them. And, and I, I tell you the truth, like, not the least stroke of a pen of these things, not the smallest letter will disappear until all things are accomplished. So he gears up and then he says things like, you've heard it said that, you shall not commit murder, as in he's referring back to these Ten Commandments. But he says, I tell you that anyone who's mad at someone has sinned. Anyone who calls his brother you know, a fool is sinful. Anyone who you know, kind of slanders one of their, you know, another person is in danger of the fires of hell. Why does he say that? He, and again, he says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. This is Jesus' words. You shall not commit adultery. You've heard that. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lust lustfully has committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus doesn't lower the bar. He raises it. He says, you guys have missed. This is Jesus saying, you guys have missed the heart of the law. Like, God never gave you those laws here to the Israelites to say, um, you know, hey, it's probably pretty good if you don't murder each other. Like, He never gave you the rules, like, don't commit adultery just so people wouldn't cheat on their lives. Like, that's pretty standard. What Jesus is saying is, in my kingdom, like, people aren't just not murdering each other. They love one another. They don't talk badly with one another. They don't call each other fools. Like, he's saying that God didn't give you this law on adultery to say, like, hey, like, it's probably a pretty good idea that, you know, you, you, you guys just don't sleep around a lot and cheat on your wives. Jesus is saying, like, no, it, it was never about just simply this low bar of not cheating on your wife. It's so that men would not look at women like pieces of meat, that, that, that men would treat women with respect. And say, like, you know, that, that woman is not there for me to just look at her. And, and she is an object of sexual grat gratification for me. And that's her only purpose. So Jesus says, you've missed the heart of the law. And I don't want you behind that camera to miss the heart of these laws. Don't miss it. That These laws are life-giving. They are a way that we respond to the goodness and salvation of God. This is what it means to be a subject of God's kingdom. So when we think about these being archaic, these old laws that mean nothing to us, man, these laws made this group of people human. They were bricklayers. They were slaves. And they were just dehumanized. Is that working its way in our culture? Are we dehumanizing other people? Because God's laws here are life-giving. Man, think about the Sabbath for them. God says, hey, you're not made to just work, work, work. That's not why I made humans. You're not just machines. Take a day off. Man, think about how that would hit their ears and how much life that would give an Israelite who just came out of slavery. Man, this is amazing stuff. This is life-giving words through these Ten Commandments and the expansion of them beyond. I want you guys to read Matthew 5 and 7. I also want you to read, write this down, Matthew 7, uh, verses, or chapters 5 through 7. And I also want you to read 
um, David. You know, we're going to talk about him later in the semester, or maybe next semester. But you know, later he is reading these words and he writes Psalm 119. Please, like, write that down in your notes, your phone, and go read that. And listen to the way that he speaks about God's laws, God's commandments. And so we have this concept in the New Testament of living a life worthy of the calling that we have received. So God here is saying, live a life worthy of the salvation, of the calling that I have given you to be priest to the rest of the world, to be my representatives to the rest of the world. And, and you know, final point here, seeing these laws as just rules that enslave us, like, man, I, that chokes out the relationship so much. Like, that just squeezes all of the goodness out of, you know, these commands and, and what Jesus says in Matthew 5 through 7. Like, you know, I was thinking about how to communicate this, and, and, you know, I settled on the marriage analogy with, like, me and Rachel. And if you think about that, like, what if I spoke about that, like, you know, rules and regulations, like, you know, these Ten Commandments from God, what if I spoke about my marriage like that? You know, it's like someone asked me, you know, like, hey, Cade, you slept with any women recently? Like, no, you know, no. You know, pff, Rachel won't let me. It's this weird rule she has. She won't let me sleep with other women, you know. It's like, what a poor way to view that rule that I signed on to at our marriage. Like, it goes back to, like, what I was talking about about earlier there's this huge moment in front of all my friends and family where Rachel and I took a covenant with one another and I agreed to some pretty basic things one being I'm not going to cheat on her like that's pretty basic but that being said like that was never just so that I wouldn't cheat on my wife it's so that I commit myself to her and that I don't look at other women but I value her in the good times and the bad and we grow together in this relationship through thick and thin and, and it's this concept behind us that like I don't need anything else like it's just Rachel I'm committed to her and that she knows underlying everything that goes on in my life in her life that we will be together that I only have eyes for her that's a much better way to understand that than just like you know oh, I just can't have any fun anymore like, I want you guys to see the beauty in these commandments, in these laws, and the, the terms and condition. It's about relationship. And so you have this idea that, you know, there's relationship and there's a heart to this. There's goodness coming from these laws. And, and Jesus not only, you know, doesn't do away with these and just say, you know, hey, like, no big deal, like, I died for y'all. You no, know, Jesus is saying things like, uh, if you literally talk badly about someone or if you look at a woman lustfully, you're a murderer, like, in God's eyes, you're a murderous adulterer. And he raises the bar because the heart is, like, God's people are different. They're called into this relationship with God. And, and in this relationship, that means that, that if you're going to be representative to the rest of the world, that, that you're going to look different. You're going to behave different because you are representing God's rule and reign, what it looks like to come back into a perfect relationship with God, with other people, and with the land. So the, the final really thought that I want to point to is in chapter 24 of Exodus. And man, uh, I want to share this with you guys because this just hit me in my own personal study. Um, and, and I hope that you see the goodness in this, the beauty in this. And so after God gives them all of this, you know, uh, command, all of these commandments, then in chapter, you know, basically from 20 all the way to 24, he's kind of expanding upon them. And he's talking about these commandments and um, getting spe on some specific things. But then after he finishes this, um, the people say like, yes, like we will, we agree to all this. We will obey and do everything that you say. And so then like it, it seals this covenant, confirms this covenant 
And in chapter 24, I want to read you verses 9 and 10 uh, because they are extremely beautiful. So here's what they say. Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel under his feet was something like a pavement made of sapphire, clear as the sky itself. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God and they ate and drank. So why did I you know, choose to end this lesson in chapter 24, focusing in on these verses? Man, I, I've said it a few times in this lesson already, and, and I hope that this is like monumental in your eyes and, and in your understanding so far. Like God and, and us, like our relationship, our access to his presence was severed when Adam and Eve sinned. Like sin cut us off from the presence of God. And then God gives us all these rules here in this last chapter. And he makes this covenant with the Israelites. They agree to it. And then you have this strange account. And it's if you've read Revelation, it's almost like that. They're having a hard time describing what they're seeing. But essentially they're looking up and they're seeing God like and under him is this blue sapphire, like it's God and he comes down and he does not raise his hand. He does not, you know, strike out or break out against these leaders, these normal, sinful human beings. He eats a meal with them. Like God, this, think about like how he's been described so far in this like these past few chapters, like he's fire, billowing furnace of smoke and thunder and, and shaking mountains and, and do not set foot even on the mountain that I'm on or you will die. And yet he comes down like from heaven and you see him eating a meal face to face with these people. And Good Lord, like literally, good Lord, like how amazing is that? That you see this is sort of a foreshadowing of the way that things are supposed to be. There's this beautiful moment between the Israelite leaders and God sharing a meal together that they are in perfect relationships with God, with a perfect relationship and, and they are in His presence. And, and man, like, how amazing is it to be in this God's presence? And so you have all the reality of that description that we've talked about, but then you have, you know, of him like billowing fire and smoke, but then also he wants a relationship. He's a jealous God. So you have to hold both of those in tension, and we see that. And so it's like, this anticipatory story looking forward to where God is leading us where we can be in his presence and share a meal with him and my mind cannot help but think of going to the last supper so in that story you have Jesus God in the flesh sharing a meal with sinners one of which is Judas a man who will betray him and he, he takes this just like they did in this chapter 24, read it like um, there's this blood of the covenant that they kill these bulls. And it's almost like they're saying we have peace with God and we're also confirming um, this covenant with this blood. And so you have the blood of the covenant in this chapter. And Jesus, as he's eating with sinners, just like God is eating with the sinners of the Israelites in chapter 24 of Exodus, Jesus is sitting there with these sinful disciples and he says, take this cup. This is the blood of the new covenant. I'm making a new covenant. And, and I say this a lot and I hope like you are seriously getting like hair starting to stand up, getting goosebumps or just are in awe of what God is doing because he's... He's saying, like, this is the new way that I'm going to relate to you. Jesus is saying, whenever, like, I shed my blood, that, that this is what God is going to see when he looks at you. So, so just as Moses spreads the blood of this, these bulls 
to mark this peace with God and, and this covenant relationship with God on the people here that Jesus is saying, like, my blood will end the sacrificial system once and for all. And when God looks at you, my blood will cover you. This is the new covenant. I am the perfect lamb. Like, I will be slain for you. And never again will there have to be sacrifices. But when God looks at you, He sees my perfection. He sees the blood of Jesus. And so I hope that you're getting goosebumps. I hope this is like all connecting for you that that man yes god is holy but he wants a relationship for whatever reason with us and he makes a way to do that ultimately through the person of jesus and there is nothing there is nothing that we can do to make ourselves holy except for submit to jesus to come into a covenant and and say that that yes i'm going to give my life to jesus i'm going to be washed in his blood through baptism and then these rules are a response to that like they are a response to, to the salvation to the goodness of god so that we can look like god's kingdom citizens and it's not the other way around. We don't work so that we can get salvation. We don't do good things so that God will approve of us. Only Jesus has done the good thing. Only Jesus has achieved perfection. And luckily, He wants a relationship with us. And so, um, for us, like all we can do is live in response to this goodness. And I hope you guys have some amazing talk about um how these laws and and rules play a part of our lives as citizens in God's kingdom.